Today we're going to have a conversation about Bitcoin in emerging markets. And hopefully, uh, by the time of our conversation, we will have communicated the vibrance, the vibrance, the robustness, and the complexity of the Bitcoin ecosystem in the Global South. Let's meet our panelists. First, we have Youssef Nusori, who is the co-founder of the Built for Bitcoin Foundation. Next, we have Paco de la India, who is a Bitcoin influencer that has traveled over 40 countries. And then last, we have Chris Hunter, who is the president of Galloy Wallet and also the founder of the Adopting Bitcoin Lightning Summit. Ooh. Thank you, guys. So to kick us off, I'd love for our panelists to start off by telling us, you know, a little bit about their backgrounds and where they're making an impact across the global south. Start with Yusuf. My first? Okay. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Yusuf. Um, about 13 years ago, I set foot for the very first time on the soil of Africa, and it changed my life in so many different ways. In fact, it changed my career path as well, too. I knew that one day I wanted to be able to come back to Africa after I left and be able to give back so much to a place that, that gave me so much. Um, my family's from Afghanistan. Afghanistan gave me life, but the Global South is what gave my life purpose. Mm. And so about six years ago, I found Bitcoin through my big bro, Ray Youssef, who is uh, also the co-founder of the foundation. And since that time, we've been able to build 13 schools in 10 different countries and operate on four continents, affecting the lives in a positive way of 250,000 people around the world. Not just building infrastructure, but also providing financial literacy and Bitcoin education. Oh. Paco? All right. Hi, everybody. Namaste. My name is Paco. I'm from India. And I read this book called The Bitcoin Standard in August 21. And they started the journey called Run with Bitcoin. The purpose of the journey is to travel 40 countries using Bitcoin. This sounds cool. No. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of lights, man. <laughs> It's pretty bright. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Can't see any of you. So the plan was to travel 40 countries using Bitcoin to see whether Bitcoin really is money. Because we all live in this bubble called HODL. So I just went out and moved forward. And thanks to the community, so thank you to you all. I'm going to say thank you to you all. Because of you guys, this was possible. <laughs> right. I was able to travel to 29 countries now using Bitcoin. We hosted 89 Bitcoin workshops. Orange pilled a lot of people and shared Bitcoin knowledge as we moved forward. And yes, we are very early, but this is a government job. And this is long-term preference. And keep spreading the gospel of Bitcoin. That's the purpose of Run With Bitcoin. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Hunter. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. So I'm an engineer by training. I'm from a small town called New York. Spent the first 20 years of my career in the renewable energy industry. Built a number of businesses from scratch there and then read the Bitcoin white paper in 2014. And long story short, that led me on a multi-year journey where, you know, I realized Bitcoin is so profound. You know, when I explain it to my friends who are not in the industry, I put it on par with fire and the wheel and the agricultural revolution and the printing press in terms of its import to humanity. And I know I sound like a madman to most people when I put it in those terms, but I truly believe that. And I, I didn't know how I was going to build in the Bitcoin industry, but you know, in 2014, I knew I needed to move away from renewable energy and into this industry. 2019 co-founded Galloy, which makes open source Bitcoin banking software. And shortly after that, in early 2020, as the pandemic was descending, we were trying to raise money for Galloy, and we went to all the VCs who understood Bitcoin, and every single one of them told us to, to have a nice day. They said, we love you and your co-founder, we love your thesis, we just think you're five years too early, which is what led us to El Salvador. And so in, in uh, summer of 2020, we just cold called this gentleman by the name of Mike Peterson, who was trying to get a Bitcoin circular economy going, and we said, let us build some purpose-built tech for you, pro bono, and that's the... Uh, the essence of the, the origin story for the Bitcoin Beach Wallet, which we can get into. Indeed, indeed. 
And I want to stay on that point because the Bitcoin Beach wallet was such an instrumental part of this idea of Bitcoin movement in the global south because, again, the Bitcoin Beach wallet, the work with Galois, you guys set the blueprint for the Bitcoin circular community. So I'd love for you to tell folks a little bit more about the impact that the Bitcoin Beach wallet has had on the lives of the folks in El Salvador. Sure. I mean, we, we, we started the project in the small town El Zante, which is a village of about 3,000 people, relatively impoverished to give you some you know, since, you know, the average wage is about 400 US dollars per month. And so, you know, almost, you know, probably a couple dozen people in that town ever had a bank account, period, right? So these are people who had no access to financial services. So first and foremost, if you present them with a financial technology, effectively a banking solution, which we created with the Bitcoin Beach Wallet, the first thing it does is allows people to save, right? If you don't have a savings mechanism, you basically don't have hope for the future. And if you're living completely in a cash society, your options are don't save, which is the case for most people, or put it under your mattress. You know, there was one alternative in El Zante, which was very striking to me, where there were a few people who saved literally by buying concrete cinder blocks. And the move was you would buy some cinder blocks and then in the hopes that a couple years later somebody wanted to build the project and you would sell the cinder blocks at a small premium and that was your savings account, right? And so those of us who have access to financial services take the ability to save for granted. And so just the ability to save money through a technology like a digital wallet using Bitcoin was novel. And then it opens up all new possibilities for merchants to accept payment, not just from tourists rolling through town who want to pay for Bitcoin, but now with the magic of Bitcoin, you could accept a payment from anywhere around the world, which you know, for people who live on a piece of dirt and have never even left the town in their entire life, this is truly, truly profound. Indeed, indeed. So Paco, let's transition. So El Salvador was not just the tip of the volcano. El Salvador actually planted the seeds for so many more Bitcoin ecosystems across Latin America. Paco, can you talk to me about some of the Bitcoin ecosystems in Latin America that you visited and a little bit about your experiences there? Oh, yeah. I visited the ones in Brazil. In Brazil, there are now three circular economies in three different cities. It's one in the north, Jericho Coara, one in the south, Rolante, one in the mountains called in Minas Gerais. The another one I visited was in Costa Rica. And in Costa Rica, it's called the Bitcoin jungle. So thanks to Bitcoin Beach, there are such communities that are coming across. But that has also gone all the way to South Africa, where they use it in the Ikasi. Ikasi are the slums. So in the slums, they are using Bitcoin. That means you go for a haircut to eating your food, to your car wash, people are using Bitcoin. And it is something that has inspired everybody to see what Bitcoin is. And the, f the magical thing they love the most is like Bitcoin reaches their pockets directly from random Bitcoiners around the world. That's the most beautiful thing they have seen. That's transfer of value without seeing their color, religion, creed. And I was really happy to see that. And the most important thing I learned was the Bitcoiners who have been in this eco space from a long time are here to share because they love to care. That's what they are doing. They go down, they start this economy as Mike Peterson started in El Salvador. That went down to all the way to Brazil. That went down to Costa Rica. It started in Peru. It's in Philippines. I mean, most of the places are getting on. That it's rightly said, I heard this, ask not what Bitcoin can do for you, ask what you can do for Bitcoin, right? I heard some Bitcoiners tweet. And it is really nice, and people are doing a really great job. I mean, Built for Bitcoin has done so many great things. I have not seen, in general, you see crypto people buying Maseratis and fancy Rolexes and 10 rings. But they have built 15 schools. They have given water to people. That is something that goes long term, you know, thinking long. So that's what I've seen. Thanks to Bitcoiners. Thank you. It's actually a really good segue, right? Because, you know, the, the conditions that uh, Africa is challenged with are very similar to the conditions that we see in Latin America. And more specifically, we're talking about devalued currencies, um, high inflation and broken payment infrastructure. But those are the factors that make Bitcoin shine in Africa. So let's transition a little bit. Youssef, you are the co-founder of the Built for Bitcoin Foundation. Please share with us what the Built for Bitcoin Foundation is, what it does, what you're most proud of, and the lessons you've learned. <laughs> 
Uh, what I'm most proud of is a long list, but I'll begin from the, the genesis, so to speak. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was running a, a nonprofit, uh, fiat based traditional organization, and uh, it was a water based organization building water wells in Africa and Asia. And we got a, a very significant contribution that came in, uh, but unfortunately, it was flagged by our financial platform at the time as potential fraud. And so, what led to me was needing to reach out to this donor, you know, thanking them for their anticipated contribution, but also in the same email, requesting them to make another form of payment. It's a very uncomfortable conversation to have, as you can imagine. And the person on the other side of that email responded back to me, "Do you accept Bitcoin?" And this is 2017. I had absolutely no idea what Bitcoin was. In fact, I had never even heard of the term Bitcoin before. So as anyone else would, I went on to Google and I typed in, what is Bitcoin? Mm. And you all can imagine all the different things that came up, many of it negative, some positive. But nonetheless, I was considering and contemplating, do I really want to get involved with this? There's terrorism references here. There's money laundering references. It's because I was so uneducated and illiterate on it. So I had this resource, the person on the other side of that email, and I was asking them questions. Well, how can I incorporate this into my own NGO? And you know, the responses back and forth were, were really positive. And the person on the other side of that email happened to be Ray Youssef. And so Ray has been orange-pilled me via email, okay, <laughs> uh, almost six years ago. And since that time, you know, we got on a call right afterwards, and he said, I have a dream. I want to be able to build projects using Bitcoin. Can you help me do this? And I said, heck yeah, let's do this together. Because I, I had already built a couple of schools myself. And so we wanted to change the narrative of what Bitcoin was to the world, mm -hmm. where we can showcase a brand new use case that not many people are speaking of or even, even, even be able to see, which is philanthropy. Not charity, philanthropy. Philanthropy and charity, the way that I describe it is charity is fiat-based. It's very short-term band-aid effect. When it comes to Bitcoin and philanthropy, it's very long term. It's a vision where we want to be able to create independent communities, just like how my friends are here and people are doing out in the, in, in the rest of the world. For us, it is about not just building schools, but building community. And that's the best baseline fundamental layer of how you can be successful in this line of work. And when did you guys start the, oh yes, please. Thank you. Tell me when you started the work with Built with Bitcoin. When did that start? It was 2017. In fact, okay. the same month that uh, Ray and I got connected is when he had sent his first initial Bitcoin for us to build our first school in Rwanda. Wow. So we've built schools in Rwanda, Kenya, South Africa, Ghana, uh, Nigeria, El Salvador. We've done work in India. So we have, and here in the United States as well too, with our friends at DFR, um, you know, just spreading education. That's the first line of defense for us, or first line of offense, I should say, is education, because that's the baseline, but then also the practicality and functionality of it. To be able to go into a community, learn from them, and listen from them to say, hey, what are the needs of resources here? And then when you're able to build a structure and say, Bitcoin built this because Bitcoin is real money, mm -hmm. there's a soft approach to having the conversation then to both financial literacy and Bitcoin education that follows after. Got it. And tell us, what is the biggest lesson that you've learned from all of the work? I know you guys are doing schools, education, water initiatives. What's the biggest lesson that you've learned from the Built for Bitcoin Foundation? The biggest lesson that I've learned is that every community that we work in is different. Hmm. And we have to be empathetic to their situation on the ground. Regardless of the continent, the country, the flag that they live under, everyone has their own feelings, their own set of beliefs. And we have to be as... Uh, responsive to that as possible. Um, for us, spending time with the communities, that has proven to be our biggest metric of success. Not the number of schools that we've built or the number of SATs that we've been able to raise, but the authentic and organic relationships that we've been able to build with these communities around the world. That's what I'm most proud of. Indeed, indeed. Okay, let's transition a bit. So peer-to-peer uh, -peer volume is highest in the global south. However, creating a peer-to-peer -peer exchange is difficult. It has compliance challenges, there's fraud, there's scams. Chris, can you talk about the work of the Civ Kit and why that's gonna be helpful to some of those challenges in the global south? Sure, so... Bitcoin has already won the battle to be money over IP, digitally native internet money. The world broadly doesn't understand that yet. And part of that is 
you know, part of the story here to come to your question is, you know, Bitcoin is obviously a hard cap money supply, but it's also unseizable, uncensorable. You can truly be your own bank, which has profound implications in the immediate term for those in the global south and probably has profound implications for those of us who are much more privileged in the global north over the, the medium term. And that's just with respect to money. And obviously money is very important to people and very important to society. You know, extending beyond that, we've seen the abuses of large corporations over the last two decades in this winner take most model for Web 2.0 with respect to your data, whether that's Google or Meta or even Apple, right, who basically are the arbiters of your data, the arbiters of what you can or cannot say. And so CivKit is obviously just at, you know, the beginning of its, of its own journey. But, you know, once we extend beyond money, you know, fundamental human rights of expression and owning your own data and owning your own identity and persona online and truly being a self-sovereign individual are, are going to be... Um, it's not just important, but there's actually going to be tools developed in order to enable that going forward. Indeed. Thank you for that. Okay, guys, now we're going to get into the controversy. Bitcoin ordinals. So Bitcoin ordinals or Bitcoin NFT exploded on the Bitcoin main chain this year. Nearly $8 million of fees were paid on the Bitcoin network. The impact of that was incredibly high transaction fees, and those fees have had an impact on the global south. I'd love to hear the perspectives of all of our, um, of all of our panelists about the impact of Bitcoin ordinals on the global south, and I'd love to start with Paco. <laughs> well, <clears throat> can we roll back the taproot? Yikes. <laughs> Like seriously, guys, can how many of you are going to roll back the tap route? And can we do that? Like, I I'm not technical, but I just saw some wizards wearing hats, <laughs> challenging the network. And yet here we are. I was listening over the last two days about what is happening in the ordinal ecospace. And it just really made me feel more emotional towards Bitcoin and said, are we ready for the nation states? And I'm happy that we have survived. Today we have about 280,000 transactions in mempool. Our fees is about 30 sats per byte. That's less than $2. And we are still able to send those transactions. And we are still strong enough. Since 2013, there was the DICE. 2017, the block size war. 2023 ordinals, 2027 nation states, 2031. So Bitcoin will survive. So Paco, as, as a practitioner in the global south, are you pro or against Bitcoin ordinals? It's permissionless. Everybody's creating, everybody's contributing in their own way. And let them do what they do. We do what we do. And we keep spreading the good word of Bitcoin. So do good, be good. OK. A perspective. Let's go to Chris. What are your thoughts? I, I think we have to accept the reality. As, as Paco just said, it's a permissionless network. People can do whatever they want in terms of trying to communicate on the network and paying a fee for such. To get, you know, make it a little more interesting and specific, you know, as I just said, Bitcoin has already won the battle to be money. If we look at just the entire world and what it's worth, it's worth roughly $800 trillion, right? Just to keep the math simple. Roughly $100 trillion of that is just the money supply, right? Mm -hmm. And then 700 trillion, so seven times that, is all of the other stuff. The equity in this building, a piece of art, your automobile, your sweater, right? Whatever the case might be. And the reality is money is fungible, right? If I give you a $5 US bill and you give me five singles in return, unless I'm autistic, I should care less, right? But everything else that we care about in life <laughs> is not fungible. Your favorite sweater, your spouse, your child, your car, et cetera. And the reality is, we're going to, over the next 10 or 20 years, figure out ways to express property rights in the digital realm in a unique way, just like Bitcoin solved the double spend problem and, and brought a unique expression to money in the digital realm, and that's called an NFT. And so what we've seen in this initial wave is just the beginning, and you, you can choose to ignore it, but it's not going away, and we're going to find much more useful ways to use NFTs. So I think this is a good wake-up call in terms of the fee mechanism and the mempool, and we need to find ways in order to give access to everybody in the global south on a layer above 
the base protocol layer in order for them to live their lives. Indeed, thank you for that answer. And some people do say that this might be an incentive for folks to move to the Lightning Network, but we do know that there are some people in the Global South that are transacting on the main chain. Youssef, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, for me, when Lightning in the Global South, um, I was just in Africa, I went to Ghana, Rwanda, the Congo, and Kenya, and not once did I ever hear about ordinals or NFTs while I was there. What I always heard was the congestion that was um, on chain. And the fees. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. And so with that being said, I think um, when it comes to the continent itself, it is the best place for lightning to be adopted on a grand scale. Sure. It's just the education is unfortunately not there. There may be a few wallets that are not lightning enabled that people are uh, able to use there. Um, but I'm sure that with Blink and, and others, um, which I was able to hear some really great feedback on from my most recent trip, that gives me a lot of promise and hope. We just need for folks to be able to have as many options as they possibly can. Um, because when money stops flowing there, life stops flowing uh, sure. anywhere around the world for that matter. But those individuals and those people and those places in the world, they're financially discriminated against way too much. They have finally found a solution um, and we need to be able to support in any way that we possibly can for them to have the most seamless, frictionless experience. Got it. Okay. So let's transition a, little, a bit. We're still um, focused on Africa. We would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the number of incredible entrepreneurs that are actually building in Africa right now. In fact, Bernard Perar, who is the founder of Bitnub, which is a Nigerian-based Bitcoin financial services firm, he was supposed to be on his stage, but he wasn't able to get here. I just wanted, Youssef, if you could share with me a couple of the amazing entrepreneurs that you've met along the way, along your journey. I mean, there's a lot of entrepreneurs that you know many people don't know about that are doing amazing work in their own communities, like just community builders. Um, uh, Master Guantai in Kenya, for example. Um, you have Glory, who's in the Congo. Uh, we have some folks in Rwanda. Uh, the team that's in South Africa, Herman and, and others, and Port Elizabeth, where we work mainly. Bernard and, and, and what Binab are doing for the continent itself is absolutely amazing. And you know, Ray, obviously, um, you know, from Egypt. It's amazing to be able to see the, the opportunities that they're presenting for people. I'll share a, a very vulnerable story with all of you. Every time I try to go to a new country or, or to a new area, just like how Paco does, um, I try to meet up with as many Bitcoiners as possible. And so um, I had just visited one of our schools in Ghana and one of the Ghanaian uh, Bitcoiners, you know, we were sitting down, we were having dinner and he, he pulled me to the side and said, you know, you, you are a part of a, a solution for these young kids on the continent. And I said, in what way? He said that you are uh, reducing the crime in our area. And I said, oh, okay. in what kind of way, in what capacity? Uh, he said that because you all are helping opportunity for kids that are, should be on the streets or would be on the streets to be able to learn about how money, uh, um, how money works and for them to be able to make money, whether it's through trading or to what up their lives um, on the financial system. And so that really struck a chord with me, knowing that all these young men and women need on one of the youngest continents on the planet is an opportunity. And Bitcoin provides that opportunity. So I really took that away from my trip and I said, that's the fire, the fuel to the fire that is needed moving forward. Indeed, indeed. So let's talk about conferences in the Global South, because what we find is that conferences are where Bitcoiners can get together, connect, and share ideas. Uh, Chris, and I know you were instrumental in developing the Adopting Bitcoin Lightning Conference in El Salvador. Can you talk about the importance of, of that conference and how it was able to kind of spur the conversation in El Salvador? Sure. So as mentioned, we went to El Salvador in summer of 2020 and launched the uh, alpha version of the Bitcoin Beach Wallet shortly thereafter. It was roughly two years ago here in Miami, we were by video conference, President Bukele got up and said Bitcoin would become legal tender. That was June 5, 2021. And then the law went into effect just three months later, September 7th. And I mentioned that because in those three months in between, we were running around El Salvador meeting with business leaders, meeting with the bank CEOs, and it was clear they were not taking the Bitcoin law seriously at all, right? They were ignoring it, completely dismissive, didn't feel that they needed to deal with it. And also at that point in summer of 21, there hadn't been a global lightning summit for more than two years since the event in July of 2019 in Berlin. 
And so even though we were running a high growth company and had never organized a conference before, we decided on 10 weeks notice in the middle of a pandemic, we're going to organize the biggest wow. lightning conference in the world, <laughs> which we did. And we decided it was super important to hold it in El Salvador in large part to come back to your question, to educate the local business community on what Bitcoin is and why this might actually be beneficial for them. Indeed, indeed. And I also have to mention, in terms of conferences, um, they, uh, last year in Ghana, we had the first annual uh, con Bitcoin conference on African soil. That's the Africa Bitcoin conference. So that was huge. That was held in December. <laughs> Thank you. Historic. That was a historic conference. That conference is happening again from December 1st to 3rd in Accra, Ghana, if folks are interested. Now, Paco, there's also a Bitcoin conference in India, and you're scheduled to speak. Can you talk about the Bitcoin ecosystem in India and why you're most excited about it? Please come to India. <laughs> Seriously come. We accept dollars, pounds, sats. Um, I'm really excited for India is because India is 1.5 billion people. We have 27 languages, and we are part of BRICS. All right? And in India, my father is really excited for the CBDC that's coming. And that's true. <laughs> Think about it. 1.5 billion Indians, 1.5 billion Chinese. I got 3 billion people. That's what Strike just made global. That's what we already have. So the Indian Bitcoin conference is a signal to those billion people out there like, hey, hold on, listen, there's an alternative. So I'm really looking forward to where we would be able to share what it is because we already have the number one Web3 companies called Polygon coming from India. We have these multiple people who are busy sitting on a phone saying, hey, I'm David from Denver, who oh, I'm John from Minneapolis. The call center people are now busy coding, building these blockchains and thinking that's the way out. Now, those guys are not ready to hear what Bitcoin is hmm. because they all want money. See, it's a time preference game. Because I have a stomach, I have a family, I want to make money, I want to buy a house, I want to buy a car. Everybody wants that. What's wrong in that? We all use Instagram, we all love it, we put likes. So for India, it's a message like, hey, there is Bitcoin. We have a strong coders community. You know, Indians are really smart, technical with the numbers. And so it's like a good, strong message. As for Africa, it was there. In Africa, we saw the entire community come together. And this is what it would be for India, where we'll be like, hey, there is Bitcoin. Hold on, there is Bitcoin. Yeah, there are ordinals too, but there is Bitcoin. So I'm really looking forward to like have a strong message out there, because BRICS is coming in strong. And everybody, and China owns the global south. I was in Africa. And they own the seaports, airports, roadways, bars, casinos, restaurants, the mines, everything they own, all the way from Cambodia, all the way to Kenya, Pakistan, Oman, South Africa is part of BRICS, hmm. Angola, Ghana, Nigeria, come down here, Argentina, Chile, they own it. There's no way out. How do you move your cars? You want to buy a Tesla there. How do you do that? By using a Chinese port. So they're very excited about what is coming, de-dollarizing, let's get the hanging fruit, let's go for the dollars, let's go. Ah. So I'm really hoping that this message for the Indians would be like, hey, Bitcoin, come over. So namaste, please come to India if you're wanting some deli belly, some curry. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Paco, can you tell us when that conference is happening? Uh, it's happening in October. I know there are a lot of conferences, guys. <laughs> I know it's in the October 13th to 15th. Yes. If you can make it to the other side, we will welcome you with hospitality. But if you can't make it, please do share your blessings and come next year. You're more than welcome. Indeed. Okay. Okay, closing comments. Um, you know, I'd love to hear from all of our panelists what are the biggest barriers to Bitcoin in the global south? I'll keep it short and Sorry. sweet. And they're, they're the same barriers. Well, I mean, this, the two that are top of mind are the same everywhere, whether south or north. And it's awareness and education is one. And then UX and design is another. I mean, most Bitcoin apps fall down, particularly on UX. And we can do a much better job there. Indeed. Paco? 
Dude, language. <laughs> there are over 3,000 languages in Africa, 800 in Nigeria. If you remove IMF and put Nigerians, they can run the world. That strong Nigerians are in moving money around the world. That's what they move, they move money. <laughs> but the information doesn't get forward from English to Khausa. By the time it reaches there, there is emotions and fufu on the way. <laughs> so language is the biggest barrier. And if we can get past the other side of that language barrier, we will have a much more connected world with that. Indeed. And actually, on that point, really quickly, um, did you come across, I understand there are a couple of projects that are out there to, to close those language gaps. Can you talk about a few of those projects? Yeah. Exonomia. Exonomia is a project run by Machakura guy, Kogatso. He's from South Africa. From South Africa, right. He's teaching Bitcoin in about five different languages. There's another project called Bitcoin Matani from Kenya. Mm -hmm. Master uh, Guantai. From Master Guantai. Master Guantai from Kenya. Yeah. Doing translation in, projects in, in Kenya. In Swahili, Kiswahili, which is a spoken language of almost 150 million people in that region of the exactly. world. So both, both these points are, are, are key points. I was going to say education and language barrier. That's 100% that's, that's there. Um, and I really hope that next time we're speaking that it's called the emerged markets because there's so much that's happening in Africa and the global south already. And for us to you know, distinguish it and determine it as the developing world that's already developed in my eyes, it's just, it's just a different way. right? And we have the great equalizer now, which is Bitcoin, to put us all on an equal playing field. Um, you know, they're no lesser than we are. In fact, we have so much more to learn from them. And I've learned so much about my own self uh, from being there on the ground. And so I'm really hoping that, you know, next time we can talk about this and it's, what can we learn from them instead of them learning from us, so. Indeed, well, thank you so much for all your comments, guys. Thank you. <laughs> I think the big takeaway here is that um, the Global South is teaching us about Bitcoin, and hopefully Bitcoin is a light for hope and freedom and justice uh, for the Global South. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Miami, for the last three years in this amazing city. The whole world shut down, but Miami welcomed us with open arms. We want to show Bitcoin to the whole world. We are taking the conference on the road to set the stage for Bitcoin in a new city. Nashville. Bitcoin 2024 is coming to Nashville in Tennessee. A city that is known as a music and freedom city. Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville from July 25th to 27th.